Thank you, uh, Peter. Gosh, um, I've worked for 23 years in America, and people say, where were you? And I said, I was in the country of California. And I feel today, with all the positive vibes in this room and, and the planning and the strategy and everything going on, that I'm in the country of Western Australia. It's, it's really good to see. Um, and I've got to say, I'm honoured to be following the visionary presentations of uh, Premier Cook and Minister Bowen. I too acknowledge that we're meeting in the ancient country of the Wajuk Noongar people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. But I also note that we are meeting today against the backdrop of the humanitarian tragedy of the war in Israel and Gaza, and the catastrophic aggression of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It just staggers me to see, yet again, that human nature can be superbly creative in developing art, science and technology while being frustratingly destructive in our treatment of each other. Now, apart from raging conflicts, the biggest challenge, as Minister Bowen just said, to our planet's survival is to put the brakes on climate change. The science is clear, greenhouse gases trap heat and cause global warming. The sources are clear. Fossil fuel consumption emits the lion's share of global emissions, nearly three quarters. Agriculture, chemical industries and waste degradation account for the remainder. We must stop emitting greenhouse gases, but where do you start? You start with the lion, the fossil fuels. The game plan is simple and well known replace coal and gas-fired electricity with zero emissions electricity. Then produce more of that zero emissions electricity to replace the direct combustion of fossil fuels in buildings, in transport and in industry. Where the fossil fuel was being used as a chemical feedstock, we have two options. First, we can turn to modern biofuels. Or we can use hydrogen either directly or combined with carbon, oxygen and nitrogen to synthesise complex industrial chemicals. Globally, by far the fastest grow growing sources of zero emissions electricity are solar and wind power. Last year, 83% of new electricity capacity additions came from renewables. 83%. Only 17% came from fossil fuels and nuclear power. And this progress is reflected in the global investment mix. The global investment in clean technology in 2022 was 1.1 trillion US dollars, which for the first time exceeded the investment in fossil fuels. And this year, the investment in clean technologies is on track to reach 1.7 trillion US dollars. Now, much of that investment is in enormous gigafactories to make solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electric vehicles, electrolyzers, and heat pumps. And all of those factories need energy transition materials. Their need for consumables is an export opportunity for Australia, in which we will transition from being a petrostate to being an electrostate. To a substantial extent, Western Australia will lead the charge. There are three ways for us to claim the electrostate moniker. The first is to export renewable energy in the form of hydrogen and ammonia. I call that shipping sunshine. The second is to add value to our mining output by exporting decarbonised products such as green iron and ammonia. In the case of green iron, Success will involve fundamental changes, not only to the technology, but to the industry itself. The technology shift will be to replace metallurgical coal in a blast furnace with electricity and hydrogen. The industry shift will be to produce the green iron in the resource-rich country, such as Australia, rather than in an integrated process in the steel-making country, such as Japan and Korea. The reason for this industry shift is that shipping hydrogen is expensive. Thus, it will be much more cost effective to use the hydrogen here in Australia where we will make it. A secondary benefit 
will be reduced scope three emissions for Australian mining companies. Another decarbonised export will be nitrogenous fertiliser, and that's being pioneered by Yarra and Onji in the Pilbara. The third way to become an electrostate is through exporting battery materials, such as lithium, nickel and cobalt, and through exporting rare earth elements, such as neodymium and praseodymium, for use in electric car motors and wind turbine generators. It's a double opportunity for Western Australia because the world is hankering not just for the lithium ore, but for green and responsibly refined lithium hydroxide. Fittingly, lithium hydroxide refining in Western Australia is on track to contribute 10% of the global output by next year. There is also scope to, add, to provide further added value by combining nickel, manganese and cobalt salts into precursor cathode active materials. Similar value-add projects are underway in refining nickel ore to nickel sulphate, and the imminent commencement of processing by Linus Rare Earths at its facility in Calgary to produce mixed rare earth carbonates. Developing and optimising these activities will help to diversify the Western Australian economy while decarbonising its export of products and its energy system. So I've just outlined some of the opportunities and the growing international demand. However, as has been mentioned this morning, the competition will be intense. So we have to be fast and smart. There are three sources of competition. There are probably more, but three sources of competition that are in my mind. The first is other resource-rich countries, such as Chile, Saudi Arabia, and Indonesia. They are rapidly positioning themselves to succeed in the shift from petrostate to electrostate. In our favour, we have all the resource materials, low sovereign risk and experience delivering big resource projects. The second source of competition is from countries that are allocating massive government subsidies to the clean energy transition. The United States Inflation Reduction Act is a standout example that is hoovering up international investment. The Australian government's $2 billion hydrogen Head Start program and the $6 billion critical minerals facility are important responses. And they will build on our free trade agreement status and the negotiations towards listing Australia as a US domestic source under the De Defence Production Act. Speed is important. The US Inflation Reduction Act, it kicked into gear it's seemingly overnight. In the year after the Act was legislated, it attracted 280 billion US dollars in private investment into clean energy projects and created 170,000 new jobs. The third source of competition you might find surprising, and it's, it's innovation. As you know, the demand for lithium, nickel and cobalt is growing at unprecedented pace. McKinsey predicts a seven-fold increase in battery production in the eight years, seven-fold increase in eight years from 2022 to 2030. However, if the price of battery materials remains high, innovative scientists and engineers will develop alternatives. And it's already happening. The newcomer on the block is lithium ferrous phosphate. Known as the LFP battery, this battery eliminates the expensive nickel and cobalt. It's making headway. The market share of LFP batteries rose rapidly from 6% in 2020 to 30% in just two years, 30% in 2022. Now, there's no immediate cause for concern because the total market for demand, demand for batteries is growing much faster than the share of nickel and cobalt is being eroded. And those batteries still need lithium, the preeminent battery metal. But there is an emerging contender to lithium too. Sodium, the metal in common salt. Sodium ion batteries only use inexpensive earth abundant elements such as sodium, iron, phosphate, manganese. The shortcoming of sodium ion batteries is their low energy density. But that is irrelevant in stationary energy storage. 
In that market, their lower cost is likely to make them a strong contender. Notwithstanding the low cost, sodium ion batteries will not usher in the demise of demand for lithium, nickel and cobalt, because lithium ion batteries will continue to dominate in medium and high performance electric vehicles and in smartphones and other consumer electronics. The reason I have mentioned sodium ion batteries is to illustrate that innovation will and already is lead to a changing utilisation pattern that all players should be aware of. Whatever the mix of metals, export success will depend on being able to supply at lowest cost with the best ethical and emissions credentials. Our emissions credentials here in Australia will depend on our use of low emissions energy for all our mining and refining processes. Western Australia's energy transformation strategy, championed by Premier Roger Cook and Minister Bill Johnson, with support from the Rewiring the Nation Fund, we just heard about, championed by Minister Chris Bowen, will enable the massive scale-up of renewables to support the mining industry. And solar and wind power will be the workhorses. The difficulty is that solar and wind generators, they need to be supported by storage, by transmission lines, distributed resource management and efficient operating system software. Western Australia can and is leading in all these areas. But what are the risks? Two worth mentioning are slow approvals and high costs. So let's start with approvals. Delays and uncertainties in approvals tie up project developers' capital allocations and require huge investments of their time and personnel. Minister Bill Johnson is well aware of this and has worked tirelessly to cut the red tape in the mining industry and it is clear that Western Australia is showing leadership resolving the challenges. As we look at the regulatory environment, it's worth reflecting on the purpose of regulations. The purpose of regulations is to ensure social benefits while simultaneously facilitating commerce. It is not one or the other, it is both. Unfortunately, there are examples in Australia where the balance is almost entirely biased away from commerce. And of course, additional delays are caused by landholder hostility to new projects. As a general rule, mining companies, transmission line companies, regulators and governments should try to learn from what has worked in the past in successful projects in Western Australia, elsewhere in Australia and elsewhere in the world. For example, last month I had the opportunity to drive the length and breadth of Denmark and I was astonished to see wind turbines everywhere. The lesson in that case is that the landholders in Denmark are supportive because they are consistently encouraged to be co-investors in the projects. Landholder hostility can be partly addressed by minimising the footprint of existing and new mines. So it is encouraging to see that mining companies are increasingly turning to precision mining. The idea is to minimise the environmental impact by extracting more metal from a given ore, to minimise waste and the acreage of the mine and tailings. There is much that we can do to speed up the approvals process, including pre-approvals in designated zones. However, it sometimes seems that the goals of the environmental ministers and energy ministers are at odds. And I know we've heard about cases today where they're working together, which is great. But where they're at odds, we need a mechanism to reconcile those goals. During COVID, we had a national cabinet and some of, cabinet and some of the states operated crisis cabinets. With that as a guide, I have to say I agree with the suggestion from Tony Wood at the Grattan Institute that equivalent mechanisms would be worth considering for the clean energy transition. The second main risk I mentioned is high costs. For example, the cost to build transmission lines is more than twice as high in Australia than in comparable countries. Some of the reasons are beyond the control of the electricity sector, such as inflation, interest rates and competition in the, in the international supply chain. But other factors can be addressed. These include skill shortages, system design, over-specification, poor labour productivity and slow approvals. Well, given the high construction costs, minimising the quantity and scale of new transmission lines is warranted. And that's where battery energy storage comes to the rescue. At utility scale, batteries co-located 
co-located with new wind and solar farms will enable them to utilise their connection to the grid more efficiently. This will be achieved by increasing the transmission line capacity factor. Furthermore, co-located batteries will enable solar and wind farms to supply energy on demand. Now, this approach was advocated in one of the recommendations in the 2017 review of the national electricity market that I chaired, and it is recognised in the government's capacity investment scheme. Leaving utility scale and looking at the rooftop scale, if we get the parameters right for investment in behind the metre batteries, we will be able to confidently continue rapid expansion of rooftop solar to support the race to 82%. Now, as we introduce more solar and wind electricity into the grid, there are integration costs, such as batteries and the transmission lines we've been hearing about. These costs per megawatt hour, they increase with the percentage of solar and wind power in the generation mix. And following the dictates of the 80-20 rule, the cost to integrate the last few percent can sometimes be as much as the rest combined. In particular, Batteries are cost effective for durations up to 12 hours. However, there's not much economy of scale as one further increases the size of a battery to achieve long duration storage of many days. And to add to the pain, the opportunities to earn an economic return from long duration storage are limited. So given the soaring cost to complete the last few percent of the renewable energy transition, the most practic practical way, as we heard from the Premier, to plug the hole is with gas-fired electricity. If we were to operate an electricity system in Australia that is 90% renewables and 10% gas, that might not be perfect, but it would certainly be very good. The emissions intensity of our electricity supply in that scenario would be extremely low, approximately a third of Denmark's today, and better than nuclear-powered France. The importance of gas to our domestic energy supply has been well recognised by the Premier and by Minister Chris Bowen in their comments this morning. What is true in Australia is also true in other countries, which is why Australia's commitment, led by Minister Madeleine King, to maintain our gas export capacity is highly appropriate. Premier, thank you for the invitation to address this summit. It is an important day for identifying how Australia as a whole and Western Australia in particular, can lead the way in the global transition to clean energy. Western Australia has, to be, has the potential to be what you refer to, Premier, as a green energy superpower, and what I refer to as an electrostate of the future. Let's make it happen to all participants. May the force be with you. Thank you.